Hello, this is PJ Gubatina Policarpio with artist Chanel Stone, and this is Notes from Moad, published by Art Practical. Chanel Stone is a photographer living and working in Oakland, California. Stone's practice is invested in challenging insular views of Blackness by expanding on narratives subject to Black erasure. This avidity has led her to explore the renaturing of the Black body to the American landscape, fueled by the conflicting lineage surrounding the African American legacy and nature. She is inspired to create work that highlights this long-standing connection to the land. Stone has exhibited at SF Camera Work, Aperture Foundation, and the Center for Photography at Woodstock, New York. Stone's solo show, Natura Negra, Black Nature, was on view at MOAD from December 2019 to March 2020. Before we begin this conversation, I invite you to join us in acknowledging that we are on the unceded traditional homeland of the Yalamu and Ohlone Ramatish peoples who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We pay tribute to indigenous elders, past, present, and future. In light of this time and our collective efforts uh, to contain COVID-19, we are conducting this interview remotely, so please excuse any audio interruptions. All right, hi Chanel. Um, where, are, where are you right now and how are you holding up? Right now I'm in Berkeley and I'm staying with a friend currently uh, throughout the shutdown. And um, so far I'm doing better, I feel like last week it was an adjustment. It was much harder for me just with the whole being laid off thing. I'm an hourly worker, part-time, etc. So that came as a shock. And um, this week it balanced out a bit. I had a lot of support from the community, my community of friends and whatnot, just helping me through it financially, etc. And now I'm in a much better place to be able to um, focus back in on my practice and just what I'm going to do throughout this time. Yeah, I'm so I'm so happy to hear that, and I'm so glad that um, you know folks in the community really pushed through. I think I think it's such a it's it's a moment you know to really think about where we are and how you know how organized how how society is organized and you know where artists fall on that spectrum as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the, um, economy and kind of. Um, systems in place. So I'm so happy to hear that you are um, safe and housed and, you know, doing much better. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you more about your practice and to talk to you more about art. So, um, yeah, uh, tell me, when did you start taking photographs? I started taking photos as early as the age of 13 when I got my first point shoot camera from my dad and um, that was just like you know I was a kid just playing around with it I think you know I started to take it really seriously once I was in high school about the age of 17 when I took my first analog photography class and that's really where I fell in love with photography um, specifically shooting on film etc that's where it started and um, yeah so it was around that age. Uh, do you remember some of your early experiments in, in photography or some of the things that um, you um, liked about it. I know that um, the analog um, is, you know, will come back to later mm -hmm. because that's primarily what you use for the series. But um, yeah, I want to hear about kind of your early experimentations, some of the early work that you loved and some of the earlier things that you were making. Yeah, believe it or not, I feel like in the beginning, it came from social media, like specifically MySpace. That's kind of like my era when I was 13, 14, it was MySpace. And then by the time I was a senior in high school, it was Facebook. But uh, I took a lot of like self-portraits for uh, my social media profiles, I feel like. And that's kind of where it started on the base level. Um, it started with that. So at an early age, I was really interested in like how I represent myself in a photo. I felt like freer, like I could really 
convey who I truly am through photography. So um, when I was in high school, I feel like a lot of experimentation came with just learning how to shoot on film. Like there was no instant gratification of like seeing the LCD screen, like on a digital camera, you see what the image looks like right away. With analog, it felt like kind of like um, more uh, magical in a sense, because you didn't know what you got until you developed the film and um, learned how to do it. It was really involved, a really, a really involved process, but I think that's what I liked about it. But I had learned on digital. That's kind of like my era. And then I went back to, to film that way. So it was kind of like a reverse thing. Um, the early experiments were just portraits of my friends, I feel like. Aside from me talking about like the social media portraits of myself, it was my friends. I always like shooting other people. Portraiture was my favorite um, area of photography to focus on, and it still is. So it was a lot of stuff like that, um, you know, interesting outfits, fun location, things like that. Um, I shot objects as well, too, but it was, it was it started with my friends, photographing my friends. Wow. It's so interesting to hear that kind of early interest and I think early, you know, experimentations and how it can really um go through and transcend to um your work today but you know mm -hmm. in a highly highly nuanced um manner and a highly you know skilled and, and crafted you know narratives but at the core are these kind of similar you know interests of self you know portraiture and expression and you know friends and 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 kin and family around that so i really like that 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 that, that continuation yeah um so uh yeah. yeah i was gonna add to that by saying like me and my friends are definitely introverted types in school still am kind of an introvert but i think that's kind of why i gravitated to photo because it's like like i said you can convey so much more um, through that versus being an introverted, like quiet type, somehow with photos, just like you can be as loud as you want it to be. So I think that's interesting to know too. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 interesting also like how social media has really um, impacted and has really you know became a conduit today. You know, if we think about it today through Instagram and um, you know whatever means of. Oops, you know, image making and, 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 you know, um, you know, move, moving image, TikTok and all of these things and how it kind of just goes back. Um, and you kind of have this back and forth relationship, um, mm -hmm. with, um, so yeah, let's, uh, look back a little bit more and, um, tell me about, you grew up in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, if you, um, just tell me, you know, what, you know, set up, what that was like for you growing up um, in terms of, you know, a lot of the work that you do deals with landscapes and, and nature and the urban environment and how, you know, that also, um, you know, what were your earliest experiences with these things and how did they intersect, you know, nature and, and, and the landscape of Los Angeles and how that kind of impacted your earlier um, you know, work, but also thoughts. Or... Yeah. So yes, I'm from LA originally. And I feel like now that I've um, lived in another city, being here in Oakland, and just looking back, um, LA is very organized, like the way the nature is there. It's very manicured, very strategic where it's placed. It doesn't really overgrow its um, container, so to speak. And it's just, it's just very concrete. I feel like more than any other, any other city, even when I would uh, travel to New York, I felt like New York was much greener and Oakland definitely way greener than L.A. So um, when I was in L.A., I feel like the earlier work was more so focused on um, the landscapes that are in Southern California. So more like desert like landscapes. Like when you go a little outside of L.A., it's you quickly get met with like the desert. And that's kind of like where I like to shoot before. Like I was searching for greenery, I felt like when I was in L.A. versus when I moved to the Bay. It was different. It's all around you. You don't really have to like look as hard for it. But I was always interested in that. Like I said, even when um, I was living in LA, I still like to photograph in nature. It was just a different type of nature, a whole different type of context. And as far as how that um, affected my relationship to it, I think it's what I said. Like I was searching for it more. And my earliest memory of that was my grandmother's garden. 
which she had always lived in like um, condos. Like now she lives in a house, but even that the house doesn't have a um, lush backyard. It's a concrete patio backyard with a small area that serves as like a flower bed. So she always would have potted plants just stacked all over the place. Um, just she grew them that way. So she didn't have like actual soil to work with. She just used, um, you know, plants and um, planters and whatnot. So that's where my earliest memory came from is like my grandmother specifically, um, my dad's side and my mother's side, they both have green thumbs and grow plants. And um, that's kind of like, like I said, the earliest memory. And um, that influenced me because I, when I looked back with the series, for instance, um, the series that was in uh, the Moa show, Natura Negra, mm -hmm. That was important for me to figure out, like, why was I attracted to greenery and the environment, et cetera. And it was because of that. Like, at an early age as a child, it was always around me, just in a different context. Sure. Um, and I know that from our earlier conversations, um, not sure, but um, your the potted earth photo is taken at your grandmother's. Back yes. Right. Yes. That's so, the one I was referring to. Right. So you can see specifically in that um, portrait um, back home in Los Angeles. So, um, yeah. And I, so I want to kind of move towards the show since you kind of made that opening. So again, congratulations. Thank you. Um, your show Natura Negra was on view just recently, recently closed in March. So um, it's on view until um, since December. So uh, let's start with the self-portrait, which you um, kind of alluded to already. So these portraits are black and white images, you know, with a central figure, yourself, um, kind of directly gazing into the camera, into the audience, kind of set in this very lush, verdant um, environment or setting. Mm -hmm. um, so walk me through um, the, the making um, of these portraits and some of the choices that come along with it, you know, you know, working with uh, medium format, format camera, black and white, you know, the setting, um, the pose, like walk me through all of that. So usually when I work, it kind of starts with me um, scouting first. Like I'll just take a walk in the neighborhood or the environment that I'm at and look for something that catches my eye. That's usually how I find the location. The only exception to that were the ones in uh, my grandmother's garden, because obviously I, I knew deliberately where I wanted to go. But otherwise, it's kind of candid. Um, I just walk around and find them. And with the exception, like I said, of my grandmother's garden and um, a piece titled um, Imperial Courts, that one I knew deliberately I wanted to go there. That's a housing project in the uh, South LA area that I wanted to photograph, which... Um, that space is a uh, low-income public housing unit that I felt was the epitome of, like, the inner city or buildings like that. So that was um, something I deliberately had in mind, like, um, uh, you know, pre, like, premeditated. Otherwise, like I said, I'm just walking around and I find something. So, um, for instance, the main photo, the, the largest photo in the exhibition, um, right in the beginning, titled um, In Search of a Certain Eden, it's the one where I'm standing in the middle of this plant, in this courtyard. I had scouted that. That was in Brooklyn. I saw that, um, I found that, that location like in a different trip. I, that was probably back in July of um, 2019. And I wasn't able to photograph that until September of 2019 when I went back because I needed um, to set it up. I needed someone to like assist me with that because that particular camera didn't have a self timer. That's something with this, this image making. All the cameras I use um, usually have a self timer mechanism so that way like I'm normally shooting just by myself it's me and the camera and um I don't know I don't really like pick the poses out ahead of time they kind of just happen naturally but with that particular picture as I mentioned I, I photographed it the second time around because I needed help with that one that assistant but um yeah it's it's just me literally walking and finding um what I'm looking for it's not always so deliberate but um, I feel like usually what I find speaks to what I'm talking about, like plants overgrowing the environment they're in, et cetera. Um, 
Yeah, hopefully that answered the question. What else about the process? Yeah, no, I love actually knowing that walking is a big part of the yeah. image making and kind of walking along, you know, these the streets and really I love I love that vision of you just paying attention and looking um and walking and looking at, you know, spaces that could, you know, create um, a compelling image for you mm-hmm. with certain criteria, right? It has to have some foliage, some sort of street, some sort of urban um, kind of, um, you know, touches. Um, mm-hmm. And then what about the black and white? How did that mm-hmm. come about? Because mm-hmm. I feel like when we think of nature, our immediate compulsion is to show how green it is, how, you know, um, kind of, show off those kinds of tones and colors and um and so i'm interested to know you know the decision um behind the black and white tonalities of the series yeah thank you for mentioning that i almost forgot so um when i was at cca um i transferred in as a transfer so i did two years there for my undergrad degree and one of the classes i had to retake was medium format and that class is a dark room class it's black and white I was a little upset because I was in love with color at the time and I didn't want to go backwards. I feel like I graduated from black and white, like I was done with it. But no, I had to retake the class um, when I transferred in and I fell in love with it again. It was really weird because I was so anti at a certain point. Like I just felt like I used to think black and white was limiting. So I was excited to be working with color. But when I went back to it, I guess I looked at it with a different set of eyes and I just really loved... um, the control with it because it's more like I'm actually developing the film myself. I'm actually like printing it in the dark room. The works at Moad were not dark room prints, but I, I printed them on myself as well. Those are just um, archival inkjet prints. But I liked how involved it was from beginning to end. And black and white has a timeless feel to it. Um, that may sound a little cliche, but it, it's true. Like you aren't really able to place it in a certain like span of time. Like I feel color ages differently. Black and white just holds on a little bit more. And I feel like it kind of makes you focus in on the content more. You're not distracted by colors. It's just literally about what the image is in itself and then the tonality, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I thought it spoke also to the traditional canon of photography, like all the greats, like back in the days, black and white, that's where it started. So I feel like by shooting in black and white, it kind of like roots it, it anchors it back into like speaking on... um, the history of photography, which I feel, um, not I feel, but like learning about it in school, it's very limiting. You learn about mostly white male photographers, maybe some white women. You do not learn about black photographers in the canon, maybe like one. Um, so I feel like shooting in black and white is also a deliberate stance on that. It's like including the black body into the canon. Like you have to recognize it um, into that context of like the history. So. Yeah, I think that's that's such a an important note, you know, and I think recently, fortunately for us, we've seen, you know, finally, you know, this acknowledgement of of the of of you know black photographers and, and really inserting mm-hmm. the these um narratives and these figures and these bodies. Um so uh I yeah, I wanna go back to that um mo- a little bit more and really talk about kind of the centrality of the the black figure and the black body mm-hmm. which is your yourself in these images um in these portraits and you know it's 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 very central you know you are kind of in the middle of the frame so talk to me about you know again kind of that choice of of centering and and choosing to portray yourself, you know, kind of going back to, again, the the beginning of, you know, like, you know, all of us want to see ourselves, you know, Mm -hmm. in camera. So, um, yeah. So, um, what, what was the thought process around that? Well, um, when I was doing my undergrad, um, degree moving up here, I didn't know anyone in the Bay area. So for a lot of the assignments, um, I knew I wanted to focus in on my, self to a certain degree but it was also due to the lack of knowing people around like I was used to photographing others like friends or just people I meet that um I felt were interesting Mm -hmm. but without knowing anyone you're kind of like left to use yourself as a subject (laughs) but um through the program I was um asked so many like 
questions about, about like, why am I making photos? Like it was very um, introspective. So it kind of like led me back into this self-portraiture, but in different contexts, because I think before this, I was just having fun taking self-portraits. I wasn't trying to make a whole series about myself until um, maybe two, two years ago at this point. So it was based on necessity, but also um, this introspective, like, examination of myself and like what I was doing. So with this series, um, I use myself because I'm telling a personal narrative, like my own relationship to urban uh, nature, as well as like my family lineage as it relates to this idea of being um, a black person that grew up in a, in a city disassociated from the American landscape, meaning like the rural American landscape. Uh, my grandparents are from the South, so they're very connected to that. I am like twice removed from that. And I feel like, um, you know, as African-American, like the closest thing we can get to origin point is the American South during like slavery time. Other th otherwise it's just speculative. Like I'll never know where I'm from, like beyond that. It's, it's all, I don't know. We just you know, shot in the dark. So um, I use myself to kind of like reconcile that, those histories, but also, um, you know, I'm also telling a, a collective narrative too. So I'm kind of using myself to tell, to, to literally be me, but also just being representative of like a collective like entity, I guess. So it's, it's like an ebb and flow between both of those things. Great. Um, oh, also, oh, also, sorry, I almost forgot. The reason why I'm in the middle of the frame you asked about that, it's because I wanted the viewer to just have to meet the uh, presence of like this black figure in the frame. I didn't want it to be hidden in the background or to the side, I wanted it deliberately in the middle. And it's interesting because um, in photography, they call that bullseyeing, the subject in the middle of the frame. And they kind of teach you not to do that. Right, right. But everything's so equal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like rule of thirds, like have it to the side or something. But um, with this series, I wanted it that way because of what I'm talking about, like the black presence in these spaces. So like you deliberately have to see this black figure. There's, there's no way to unsee it. So that's why I made that choice. And I'm, I'm assuming similarly with the, with the direct gaze into the camera mm -hmm. or the viewer, I think yes. it cuts through very similar modes, uh, um, you know, method, method for that. Um, yeah, there's so many interesting places that I can go with what you just mentioned, but I want to talk specifically about kind of, you know, the you call the renaturing of mm -hmm. the black body to the American landscape. And I want to, you know, you mentioned kind of rooting yourself into this, um, you know, this lineage of both, you know, photographically, artistically, but also rooting, right? Rooting yourself in, in a way, tying yourself to American the ideas of America and, and, and this mm -hmm. country. So, um, yeah, what is that, you know, what is that really for you? What does it mean? What does it encompass to, to kind of renature and make, um, the black body central to this American story? Yeah. I feel like nowadays politically, um, over the last four to five years, everyone is reinvestigating America as a whole. And with that comes this examination of like, whose land is this? Or who are the people that occupy? What is present day America, et cetera. And I feel like a lot of the times in these um, investigations, the black body is left out, like black people. It isn't really talked about. And um, growing up, I feel like through media, et cetera, it's, it's almost as if the black body is only presented in the urban context. Like we're in the cities, that's where we are. And in movies, TV, et cetera, it's like, always reinstated like oh black people don't swim they don't go hiking they don't like bugs they don't like any of these things and it's just not true but growing up you, being fed that for so so long you could start to believe that about yourself <laughs> and um you know i've obviously been hiking or different things like that but it wasn't really like a big um emphasis growing up <laughs> so with the work i'm just literally about reassociating black people to nature in any context be that literally rural or in an urban setting because there's still greenery 
foliage plants present in our urban setting, which we're always associated to. Like I said, it's always like black people are part of the city, like urbanism, et cetera. So I want to um, dispel those monoliths like that we don't belong in nature. We don't do this and that. And then, you know, dispelling this idea, like the only association of the black body to nature is slavery. I think that's very problematic. And it's always just that it was slavery and then to the city and that's it. There's so much in between, so much, so many histories and stories that aren't spoken to. So um, that's what it means to me, just like changing like our um, societal um, ideologies or like views about Black people in nature, like it needs to be talked about and brought into the forefront again, into everybody's um, uh, mind, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it, it does. I think this series really successfully conveys, you know, kind of, multiple you know holding multiple facts and 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 truths at the same time Mm -hmm. um and then i think kind of bringing it back out of you know the body and out of the figure one of the things that i really um that i you know was looking through the images again in preparation for this conversation um you know you know online now um i was really struck by you know the longer and you know the closer i got to see these images um to me it also reflects you know this sense of containment right like even though the foliage and and the 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 you know there's the lushness and there's a kind of richness um you can actually see that you know, the plants are kind of contained in these small pots or in this like patches of land in the middle of concrete or in between houses, in between buildings. So can you also, um, can you talk about kind of that relationship um, in terms of like the, the I guess, you know, the urban um, nature and how that, how you see that relating to the black body or if you do, so... Yeah. Yeah. Basically, um, I've heard two perspectives on it. Like one, which you said, which is like the the lush foliage seems to be contained. Mm -hmm. And then I see it through my lens where I felt like the plants were outgrowing their containers. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't seem confined to me. It seems like they're bursting at the seams, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And with the latter that I just mentioned, I think that's what I was trying to show metaphorically. Like in all these scenes, it's like the plants are outgrowing their literal containers, like the the ones of my grandma's garden, the piece titled Potted Earth, um, and the one literally titled In Granny's Garden. Yeah. The plants are just like, they look like they're going to fall out of the pot. Like they're just bursting through, like they're overgrown. They need to be repotted basically. And I saw that as a metaphor of like the black body in an urban inner city. Those are, that in itself, like for instance, like the projects that I mentioned that I sh- just shot a, a picture of, those are meant to like, it, they're little beehive containers. Like they're meant to keep people in a certain, I don't know, like social strata. So it seems, so like it's a metaphor of overcoming that and like growing past it, like not being restricted. I see it as like still um, like a story of resilience, basically. Like it's like this like concrete patio, like that in itself is limiting. But like my grandmother's act of like even having those potted plants is like resistance. Like I'm not going to let my environment dictate what I'm going to do. So she still made a garden, even though like that space wasn't, you know, designed to, to hold such a thing. And that's just a metaphor of like these these urban gridded cities and like how they're organized and just the resilience, like pushing past those barriers and, you know, being full of life too, like just outgrowing it. So that's how I saw it when I was photographing it. Uh, kind of the opposite of like being uncontained. Yeah. I really, really love that you, we have kind of opposing views and I'm sure people, you know, have have multiple views, but I, I love hearing from you um, what your thoughts. And I think specifically, specifically I'm looking at the ones that, um, you know, in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. you know, these kind of, open spaces that have been overgrown with such rich, lush, you know, verdant um, foliage. And then even that square of patch with these like huge, humongous leaves that really are just so um, r- beautiful. And so, you know, and, and I think I, I, I love the way that you, you know, talk about it in the, the sense of um, 
of resilience. Um, and I think in that sense too, really thinking about, you know, carving out that space. And so you mentioned that, um, you know, the images in the series in Atura Negra um, depicts various landscapes across New York City. We said Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and, and Oakland. And, um, so what is, you know, what is the significance of these spaces for you? And is it, um, is sourcing these images from these spaces important for you? Or can it be done anywhere? Or, you know, what are some of kind of your criteria for thinking about um, these images? Yeah, these cities just happen to be um, places that I um, lived in. So like LA and Oakland, specifically New York. I went there for the first time back in 2018 for a study abroad course. And I had always wanted to go to New York. That was just like some some place I always wanted to see, et cetera. Um, I still have a desire to live there. <laughs> just putting that out there. But when I went, I was expecting to be so concrete and just... Um, you know, the, what they call it, the concrete jungle, that's what they call it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, though, at least Brooklyn wasn't um, in the summer. It was so lush and so green. And that's kind of where the series started. Those are some of the older works in the um, series were the Brooklyn pieces, with the exception of the one where I'm standing in the middle of the plant. That one is newer. Um, that's where it started. So I feel like the, the criteria at this point is, um, you know, urban spaces that have greenery, that are, is thriving and growing. Um, so in that case, it could be a lot of cities. This is just where I started. These three are just what I started. And um, I think I'm looking for beauty in any inner city that was once deemed undesirable. Because interestingly enough, these three cities are undergoing gentrification at the same time. And like the stigma associated to each of these cities, um, well, the inner cities within these cities. So like Mm-hmm. Like bed Brooklyn at one point wasn't desirable, which is where that was photographed. Um, inner city LA, like South LA, something like that. Those are seen as grimy areas. Oakland had a stigma associated to it. And um, all these cities have like a rich black history that is being lost through gentrification. So in that sense, um, I am interested in cities that have a black history that's no longer there or that's um, on its way out, so to speak, through gentrification. That would be the only criteria, but um, I realized um, what I just mentioned after the fact, after I shot there, it was first just genuine, genuine, um, genuine curiosity. And then I looked deeper at what I was looking at and I noticed like, wow, these are all being gentrified. And then they were all said to be dangerous or something, or, you know, don't go there. And I just saw it as like, like quite the opposite. And that's not to um, take away from like, the problems with the inner city, because structurally, systematically, there's a lot of problems with it. I'm not trying to gloss over that with my work and just make it seem like, oh, it's beautiful. It's like this peaceful place. Like, no, there's still a lot of problems with it. But I just want to show that there's still something of value to them. Because like, obviously, so if people want to move in there now and they're gentrifying it, of course, these um, spaces obviously have something to offer. Yeah, I love um, one of the features um, that I found um, online. Uh, You have this beautiful quote, um, and I'm just going to read it. It says, I was motivated by a sense of ownership and reclamation of these structures, no matter how monolithic they are in American society. I'm invested in showing the beauty of these environments and the Black presence within them. So I thought Mm -hmm. thought that was really, really valuable. Um, uh, Speaking of, I think, just kind of spaces and and nature. I want to move a little bit into the um, kind of the the South and really thinking about, you know, your relationship to that. Do you ever see yourself, you know, photographing there or spending some time there or really investigating, you know, what that might look like, what that landscape might give you? Yeah, definitely. I feel like that's the second half of this series is to actually go to the American South and go to the places where my grandparents are from, like the cities that um, they grew up in. That was another ha- another piece to the um, the exhibition. I had a slideshow of like archival family photos. And then at the artist talk, I ended up having um, like a family album that I made that was presented in a um, book format, in an actual album of these old family, like the original old um, archival images from my, from my grandmother's collection. 
So with that, um, I was doing a lot of research on my own family lineage and places I didn't even know like we're from. So I learned a lot. Um, you know, my grandparents are from Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. So I would love to go to those states and go exactly where my grandparents are from and photograph there. I think um, realistically starting with Louisiana would make more sense because there's a lot of greenery there. So yeah, I want to take it to the actual landscape next. You know, I looked at it in the urban context and now I want to go to the actual landscape. You alluded to this um, when you mentioned some of the some of the um, the photographs and some of the archival materials. Um, I know that Natura Negra, the exhibition and the series, um, it's so easy to focus on the self portraits because they're kind of you know the larger part of the work and also mm-hmm. really the most kind of visually compelling. Um, mm-hmm. But I know that it also includes you know, the archives and the collages that you've made and some of the landscape, like strictly landscape photos and, and even sculptural installations. So um, yes. can you talk about each of these aspects? Um, walk us through the, each of these aspects, um, what they represent and what they mean and how they all relate to each other. Okay. Yeah, starting with the family archive, I specifically was looking for photos of uh, my grandparents in the South. So they came to California, um, you know, during the 1950s, during the Great Migration. That was a period of time where a lot of um, Black Americans left the South and they either went to the West Coast, they went to like the Midwest, Chicago area, et cetera, or they went to the East Coast. So um, my grandparents my great grandparents are the ones that moved them here as children to California. So my mom's side, um, they actually kept a relationship with Texas, like where they were from and they would go back often. So there's a lot of photos of them as teenagers in Texas, as children, um, even as adults. So I was looking for photos that showed where we're from and then where we are now in California. Like where did they first move to when they came to um, you know, LA, for instance. So that's what the family archive was because I was reflecting on a family lineage story. I needed to actually have those photos to support that. So that was uh, that aspect. As far as the collages are concerned, um, I'm very interested in like the materiality of photography, like what can be done besides the um, two-dimensional photograph, like how can we push the medium a little bit further. So the collages are floated. Um, They're coming out of the frame. It doesn't have glass in the front. It's um, just kind of exposed. And it's a multi-layered collage that has um, a semi-transparent paper on it. So the image behind it is kind of concealed. And then there's an image superimposed on top that you can see. So it creates this like uh, collage object and like a shape kind of by um, collaging those images. That um, was used to kind of convey like what is seen and unseen in these environments. Um, Those collage pieces don't have portraits on them. They're more so um, photographs of like an apartment building or a um, a basketball court, like things that are monolithically um, used to describe like an urban city, like structures like that. So um, that's something I actually want to keep pushing and um, moving forward with because I'm really interested in different materials and like sculptural objects, um, using photographs as like the base. That's something that uh, appeals to me. And then the landscapes that were included were just to kind of um, create, um, what's the word for it? Uh, establishing shots of like the environments that I was including. So that's why you have like a picture of this tenement, like a, like a housing project by itself. Um, that's just to like ground it in to like this urban context. So it, so it wouldn't be too monotonous with just like portrait, portrait, portrait. I wanted to have like context. And one of the other supporting images is um, a photo of my grandma's garden with like the sheet hanging and this olive vera plant. And that was just once again to establish the scene and like the location. So you kind of get a fuller sense. Mm-hmm. And how do you, they all sort of relate? Well, I guess, you know, kind of create a fuller sense of, of, of the narrative and the story. And you also had plants and all of oh, these. Yeah, things. thank you for mentioning that. I had the installation, I almost forgot. Um, <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I had a plant installation in the exhibition on a um, vitrine and that was meant to ground it back into um, being a replica of like my grandmother's garden. I wanted to uh, convey that. 
So basically, I advocated for them to be living plants, and the museum was a little resistant at first because they were worried about like bugs and whatnot. But luckily, the plants were fine. They didn't get infested or anything like that, so we were able to leave it. And the plants were kind of the only sense of color in the show because it's all black and white photos. So they kind of added this greenery and this like sense of um, life to the exhibition. And I feel like that that was a good focal point to ground it into what I was describing. Great. That's such a, a, a kind of a rich, um, you know, bringing us into the exhibition since for maybe some of those who haven't, um, who didn't get a chance to see it. Um, but I think, yeah, I think looking back at the, the run of the show um, from December to March, you know, how did it feel for you to have this show at MOAD? And what were some of um, some of the thoughts, um, some of the feedback or some of the, the things that kind of you, you'll hold with you? It was great having the show at MOAD and just the feedback I got. It was, you know, very well received. And um, a lot of the times it was students, like um, middle school students, because um, they bring a lot of, um, MOAD brings a lot of schools in. I had teachers sending me messages on Instagram, like my class really loved your show. One of my students said it made them feel alive and um, they could literally feel like what you were trying to convey and they, they, they hit it spot on like various um messages like really interpret it as it is and I think it's pretty cool that it's being understood by young children as well as adults because the work can translate at such a <laughs> immense range that was um pretty surreal and when I would come to the museum almost every week just to pop in um just to you know walk around and see what people say or to do walkthroughs of my own I noticed um they had the docent, like, explaining the work to, like, a group of children, young teenagers, um, and just how they were teaching me to the students, like, that was so surreal, like, to be taught. I was like, wow. And then um, the docent was really spot on, too, with, like, explaining it. I was taking notes on what they were saying. They were, <laughs> they were so good at it. But that was um, really amazing, just to have it, like, received by so many different types of people of various age groups. And then just being a fly on the wall and hearing people interpret it for themselves, it was translating exactly how I wanted it to. And um, just meeting different people from that, from that experience, I met a lot of folks very interested in the work and just um, museum goers that wanted to share their thoughts to me. And mm -hmm. the biggest thing I thought was awesome was the fact that it allowed people to kind of see art and what's something they might have grown up in. Like a lot of people have grown up with those type of backyards where it's just a bunch of plants. Um, you know, concrete or balcony, et cetera, and them seeing value in like their experience and like how they grew up, like their cultural background. Just being able to see like everyday life as art, I feel like that's been a huge, um, amazing feat with this whole show. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations again. I think it's such, um, you know, it's so great to see this body of work and to see this show um, in an institution like Moad, you know, really representing and thinking um thoughtfully about the african diaspora and what that means and and mm -hmm. who can be a part of that and i think that you know this narrative and 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 this body of work really stands in that space and in that you know in that kind of um yeah that kind of language and 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 you know lineage as you mentioned yeah. I thought, you know, that was really brilliant to be able to, you know, have that show there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, congratulations. Uh, let's see. Uh, you were recently featured in W Magazine's Eight Young Photographers to Follow in 2020. Um, how does that feel for you? That was um, really surreal. When I got this email on my inbox one day, um, it was from an editor and they were like, hey, we'd like to feature you. I thought it was fake. I didn't know if it was <laughs> real. I was like, this is actually BW Magazine. And it was, and um, that was really awesome. I still don't really know how they found me, but um, that was an amazing feature. Uh, just to explain my practice again, like what inspired me. And just the fact that it's W Magazine, I was just like, what is going on? So um that was awesome I'm still kind of like 
uh, amazed that that even happened. And I also didn't know that the um, the the online feature went live so soon. Like she had um, the editor had reached out to me back in January. I was like still emailing them, like, "Hey, did it ever go up? Like, can you guys let me know?" And then like someone and like a friend at school found it or something like that. It was like, "Hey, I saw you featured," and I was like, "What is it live?" I was trying to be discreet. Yeah. And then I, I then I found it myself. So I was just like amazed, just like wow. Um, it's still pretty cool. I don't know. I'm very modest. So I'm just like, uh, yeah, that happened. No, it's so great. I think it's, you know, eight out of so many Instagram. Yeah. Posts, you know? Yeah. I don't know how they found me, but I'm so thankful. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think moving into along, you know, again, you know, you've done also done some commercial work, you know, California Sunday magazine. And we've also talked about, um, fashion photography and, you know, it's, w magazine and all of these so um are you still interested in in pursuing kind of that avenue in photography and and kind of another um expression and another way of of photographing you know using fashion using commercial work um how are you feel how are your thoughts around that yeah i am i am interested in that i really enjoyed shooting for california sunday that was more um photo documentarian kind of in that way. And that was different for me, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I liked meeting the folks featured in the article and like getting to know them and then making their photos. That was totally different for me, Um, but I loved it. It was a good experience. And as far as editorial is concerned, yes, I still do have a desire to do that. Uh, Originally, that is what um, inspired me in photography, like way back. Like, so it was social media, but it was also images like that. So... Yeah, that's like another another half of photography that I want to explore. Um, probably not um, exclusively. I don't really see myself exclusively doing that. I feel like it's kind of like a half and half thing. But I definitely want to feed that other side of my interest and like get more into that because um, it takes me back to portraiture. It may not be myself, but it's like photographing others. And that's like my main desire is just photographing people. And, you know... Um, with editorial, it would be awesome to just continue what I'm interested in, which, which is like race representation, like photographing black subjects and continuing that just in different contexts. So, yeah, definitely interested in that. Awesome. Um, and I think, yeah, going back into, um, you know, the history of photography and, photo- you know, as a medium um, and, and the canon and kind of, you know, really thinking about um, that lineage, right? Um, are there um, folks that kind of you look up to or artists, photographers that you've looked up to or that you see yourself kind of in lineage to in thinking about, you know, the work that you do? I just saw, you know, Dawood Bay's retrospective. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. recently. So that comes to mind. But, you know, are there kind of, um, who do you look, up to or who do you look around at uh, as you know as kind of like this is a photographic lineage to me or is this is an artistic lineage that you recognize as being a part of your own yeah definitely um i would say carrie may weems lorna simpson uh latoya re frazier and um more contemporary i would say dina lawson i'm a huge fan of dina lawson's work um Possibly his work definitely inspires me. Different subject matter, but um, just the fact of like pushing the medium forward and doing something different, like combining photography, cubism, et cetera. I'm interested in um, black photographers that are doing that um, with Dina Lawson, her portraiture in like different settings, be them interiors or exteriors. I feel like that directly has influenced me. Um, Latoya Ruby Frazier's self-portraits um, that she has done, looking at her own family as well as well as our other uh, work in these different yeah. environments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the work that was uh, recently at SF MoMA that was focused on um, the Flint water crisis and then returning back down to the South and photographing that family in that environment. So those are people that uh, definitely I look around at. As far as um, other artists that influenced me, it would be this uh, painter, I don't want to butcher her name, but it's um, Lynette y- Yidam. Um, oh, it's a it's like a double S name. I can't pronounce oh, it. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You know what I'm talking about. Um, she has these marvelous, like huge photographs of um, black people in nature. 
just leisurely in nature or these like lush scenes. So stuff like that influences me too. It's not always photography that influences me. It's other mediums as well. And I think yeah. we have, you know, this kind of moment of, you know, resurgence to even in fashion photography, right. Of like just now kind of recognizing, um, Black ingenuity and Black innovation in terms of image making, in terms of fashion making, and in terms of all of these things. So it's certainly, um, it's not a renaissance, right? But it's 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 kind of a, a moment that I think will last, you know? So um, mm-hmm. to sort of close this conversation um, today, I'm, I'm excited and want to know what are you most looking forward to i think you know in terms of after all of this this um everything that's happening yeah i'm excited to just continue showing my work to different audiences um i see this series kind of expanding to show it um you know in new york for instance that's something i would love to do to root it back there since that city was a big source of inspiration for the work also just continuing the series um as it stands, and then um, themes related to it. I feel like I'm very interested in um, Black Body's connection just to the natural world itself. It doesn't always have to be about in the urban landscape, it's just the Black body and the natural world. So I see myself expanding on that too. I have a lot of ideas and I feel like now I'll have the time to be able to um, continue with those ideas and develop it with that. And as you mentioned um, before, It's really exciting to see in the art world, black art being um, exalted again. And um, that's hugely inspirational for me, just to to see black art on the walls. Like for instance, the Dawood Bay showed us at the moment, like I had an emotional experience walking in there, like I got teary eyed because his photos are huge for one. And just seeing like black faces on SF MoMA walls, like that has never been done before in that context. So just all of this is like fuel to keep going and to just like keep pushing and um, getting my work out there and to new, to new audiences and just developing it more. I feel like this is like the launching point. So uh, I'm excited to just go back and once all this stuff clears with uh, COVID-19, where we could travel again, you know, I want to go back to New York and uh, make some more images over there. So, yeah. And also what I mentioned about Louisiana going there. A lot of places I want to go to to keep the series going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. It's, um, you know, it's so exciting and humbling um, to talk to you and learn more about the work, learn more about your practice expansively, um, you know, get to know some of the um, motivations and some of the of the the process and 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 thinking that goes behind you know such a uh, compelling body of work um, you know just visually stunning but also really thoughtful and really complex and really nuanced um, with a lot of questions I think that that's you know that's always great to have um, to 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 show something that makes people think and makes people question. So I'm very excited for you. Very excited for what's Thank next you. for you. Um, and I look forward to yeah following um, even more the work that you do from now and and beyond. So um, thank you for for being in conversation today. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. This has been. Notes from Moad with me, PJ Gubatina Policarpio, and artist Chanel Stone. Stone's solo show, Natura Negra, Black Nature, was on view at Moad from December 2019 to March 2020. You can follow her work on Instagram at underscore underscore Califia. That's C-A-L-I-F-I-A. Subscribe to Art Practical on iTunes and follow us on Instagram at Art Practical SF and Twitter at Art Practical. Thank you. <laughs>